what we thought we would do today um, is to talk about some of our pre-Google work. Um, a lot of um, the projects that we've done before getting there. And you're going to see that it's going to range um, a lot between more scientific work um, all the way to very artistic, um, non-scientific work. So the idea is to give you a range of diverse approaches to information visualization. And to get started, what we thought we would do is sort of break the ice with something that you probably are very familiar with. So if you go to Google these days and you start typing Visby, for instance, Google will give you a series of, of suggestions, OK? And these are called, um, it's called Google Suggest. And what Google is doing, it's trying to sort of guess ahead what it is that you might be typing, what it is that you might be interested in. And the way it does that is by looking at its most popular queries. So right after Visby, I can tell that people were looking for Visby 2011, 2010, Visby conference, and so forth. So this is a very sort of efficient way to help you search the web, right? But what it also does is it gives us a window into people's psyche. Because I can come here and say, why? And see what people are asking, OK? Any? It gets quite interesting very fast. Exactly. I'm going to let you take a minute. Um, and what we thought, we looked at this data and we thought, ah, this is really interesting. How can we visualize this? And how can we go a little bit further on the insights? This is already pretty insightful, as it is. But how can we um, go a little bit further than this? So we created this uh, tool here called the WebSeer. And what it does is it visualizes exactly that list of results you were getting before. Um, so I say, why doesn't he? And it visualizes all the questions that people are going to Google and asking, right? Why doesn't he like me? Why doesn't he call? And so forth. Um, one of the things we're doing there is varying the thickness of those arrows and varying the size of the font so that you get a sense of uh, priority and ranking order uh, within that list. But then the other thing we're going to do is we're going to compare this uh, query against another one and see if they share anything in common. So I'm going to say, why doesn't he versus why doesn't she? And we can see exactly where the genders come together, right? But we can also uh, see things like, why doesn't she care or just leave and so forth. So. So yeah, let's, let's play with this a little bit and focus in on some specific he's and she's. And let's take a look at, you know, one source of a lot of questions for many people is their children. Um, so let's say, is my son versus <laughs> is my daughter? Yeah, I can't type. Um, and, you know, you can sort of get this interesting overlap that, uh, um, you know, is my daughter's name too confusing? That's actually one I haven't seen before. Um, I would refer them to the name Voyager to find there popular ones. Um, and it's interesting to see, okay, people seem to worry about their sons being autistic and their, their daughters not and so forth. So to continue with the family uh, theme here, is my husband versus is my wife. Um, right. And you can see very quickly how it goes from a funny to a more depressing portrait of marriage. And apparently, that's sort of the oracle in Google, what people are going to Google for. So that shows wondering about other people. But what about when people look inward? So here's, here's a funny little. Uh, phenomenon we noticed. What do people want to be? Um, how to be happy, cool, funny, so forth. Um, not a huge surprise. Um, anorexic maybe actually is a little bit unexpected. But um, <laughs> let's look at something how, a little more meta, how to pretend to be. And that's where we can see the intersection. <laughs> no one wants to be sick. Um, everyone wants to be cool. People want to pretend to be happy. And because no demo is complete without the political side of things, um, 
let's jump right in and say our Democrats versus our Republicans and see sort of the state of <laughs> certainty that we have today. I mean, looking at this graph, you might think, OK, we are a country divided. There's nothing we agree on. Um, but you know, I'd like to just challenge that. And let's look at Democrats are um, and Republicans are. Um, and you can see, actually, there's a lot of common ground. That's the punchline, right? So, uh, so web series available online. Um, anyone can go play with it um, to your heart's content. Um, so, how did we get here? Um, we've been collaborating for years now, and um, we've always been interested in in sort of exploring different kinds of data sets. Uh, a lot of times, when you when you talk about information visualization, you immediately think about numerical data because that's sort of the pedigree of data visualization. And that's usually the kind of data that we uh, historically have had more easily available to us. Um, but what you just saw is a visualization of text. It's a very simple one, but it's a visualization of text. What happens when you take text to a different scale, when you have much, much larger uh, corpus of, of text, for instance, that you really want to start analyzing? So back in 2000, and and five, um, we were looking at Wikipedia. And one of the things, we had already done a piece looking at how editing happens on Wikipedia and visualized that. But then we turned to people on Wikipedia. How would you visualize a person's activity over the years on Wikipedia? Okay, And it's a challenging task because what you're left with is a log. For instance, this is a person's contribution to Wikipedia, a very tiny piece of their contribution. These logs go on forever, as you might imagine. Uh, and so how do you start to tease their different kinds of, ac of activities on the site? And how do you start to visualize this kind of data? Because you know today, this person could be um, editing uh, an article about Visby for instance. Tomorrow, they could be making uh, uh, grammatical corrections on an article about the US. Very, very different things. And then the other day, they might be arguing against some other editor about whether a, a change should happen or not. So very different classes of, of, um, of activities. So we decided to. Um, take in a subset of, of users who are very, very active, so the ones that tend to have some of the highest numbers of, of edits. And these are the admins on Wikipedia. Okay, This is a, as of October 2005. Um, so we took 509 user store, uh, histories. Um, the, the, the number of edits ranged from several hundred to se several thousand. Um, there was a person who actually, if I'm not mistaken, um, had edited Wikipedia for three years every 10 seconds, every 24 hours. Um, so that gives you a sense of, of, how, um, of how busy this is. Um, so how to see these patterns, right? What we decided to do, and you're going to have to do a leap of faith here and bear with me, we decided to map the alphabet to the color spe spectrum, OK? So what we did, we started looking at the different pages that people were touching. And we were looking at the titles of those pages. And we would look at the first letter of the title of that page. Sounds very arbitrary, right? And it, it sort of is. Um, and we decided, what happens if we start assigning different hues to the different colors of, of the alphabet. Do any interesting patterns come up? Okay, So we took the first letter as the hue, the second letter as the brightness, and the third letter of the title as the saturation. Numbers, we decided to put sort of on a separate uh, category. So all the numbers are, are gray on our, on our visualization. And so what you end up with is you end up with this spectrum where Words that start with A tend to be red or reddish, 
okay? And words that start with Z or V or, or Y or W at the end of the alphabet tend to be purple, okay? okay? So this is just a sample of what some of the words would look like given our mapping, all right? So let's actually see what this looks like. So this is chromogram. And this is a user um, whose uh, username is Justin C. And I'm showing here vertically the timeline of Justin C's edits on Wikipedia. Each one of these tiny little colored rectangles is one edit that Justin C did on a given day. So we start in October 4th, 2005. And you can see on the 5th, he did a bunch of edits. On the 10th, not so many edits, but a few. Then he took a break, and then he came back, and so forth. So I'm gonna scroll down to a very um, busy moment in Justin's uh, Wikipedia life. And I'm gonna start mousing, mousing over. And I can see, okay, wine. And if you look at the mouse over, at the very top is the title of the article that Justin is touching. Wine, 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 uh, different fermentation, chaptalization, residual sugar, appellation, a bunch of different kinds of things. So these are all wine-related things, okay? So Justin is really very methodically going over a bunch of wine-related edits. He takes a break, right? and then comes back to Wikipedia in full force for beer. So then he goes to beer, okay? All different brew, uh, uh, brewers and different kinds of brewing companies and so forth. So a very methodical, very sort of project-oriented way of going through Wikipedia and deciding what kinds of changes he wanted to make. Now, there are different ways we can look at this. So right now I'm looking at it in a timeline and I'm seeing how bursty things are, right? But I can also wrap this whole thing around and put it in a block. And this, so this is the compilation of all of his edits over time, starting at the very top, coming down at the very bottom on the right. Um, and then, you know, this is still very busy, but I can but let me just say, we like showing this to biologists because yes. we feel like you guys can handle it. <laughs> yeah, in fact, this is one of those demos that we don't always show. We're like, no, this audience can't yeah. handle chromogram, but you guys can, yeah. so <laughs> hopefully you will appreciate the busyness here. Um, so the other thing we can do is, right now I'm coloring, coloring by the title of the article. I can color by comments if they left any specific comments. So I can see here, whenever the color repeats that uh, this person, they were doing actually categorization uh, changes. I can also do by different namespace on Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is divided into the article namespace, which is where all the articles that we read live. Then there is sort of the policy namespace where you talk about laws and you talk about policy on Wikipedia. That's a different kind of category of, of, of pages. And you can see how he's going back and forth between these different categories. So he's really uh, an admin, right? He's editing articles. He's talking about policy. He might be doing something um, on images and so forth. Um, Okay, so let's look at a couple of others. Um, you know, one thing that was really interesting to us is that it wasn't just people who had carefully signed in who were doing very methodical edits. But let's take a look at someone known only by an IP address. So this is someone who had not even bothered to create an identity as they edited. And here you can see a block. It's got 2,000, roughly, edits. And actually, you have to, again, appreciate the information density, that these don't look like tiny little things, but there are thousands of them. Um, and if I color by comment, I see an interesting pattern where it's switching between two colors, um, which if you look at this little graph at the right, the key says births and deaths. And in fact, that's exactly what's happening here. So this person sort of has a pattern where they go through and they do a whole bunch of deaths, then they do a whole bunch of births, then a whole bunch of deaths on different days, births and other days. You know, they take a little break, you know, they just do some plain normal dates, and then back to births and deaths. So it's sort of like the obituary and birth announcement, um, self-appointed role on Wikipedia. 